last best hope is is you, isn't it? Americans. Yeah, you know, we've long thought that we had a, a duty and, and a power to go out into the world and save other countries, countries that had failing institutions and people in conflict with each other, tribes broken down. We're not that kind of country, or at least we're in great danger of being that country. And there's no one who's going to come and save us. There's not going to be a UN agency or an NGO or a foreign power. It's entirely up to us, which is the beauty and the horror of self-government. It's all in our hands. So last best hope is us. Exactly. Does that suggest you don't actually have much hope? I mean, you know, there's quite a lot of despair around at the moment, isn't there? I began the book last fall. It was the weeks before the election. There was a sense of dread in the air in this country. First of all, the pandemic was just laying waste to so many Americans. We were leading the world in deaths and infections, which should never have happened to a country with the advanced medical care that we have here. And we also had a president who was openly threatening to overturn the election if he didn't like the results. People were arming up. People were buying ammunition. There was a sense that this could lead to some kind of civil conflict. People were even talking about, will there be a civil war? So there was a a tremendous amount of fear and, and dread. And that was the mood in which I began the book. But I began it in order to fight that mood because I don't want to give in to it. And by the time I finished the book, Trump had lost. His followers had tried to overthrow the Constitution on January 6th. Biden was sworn in and there was a vaccine that seemed to be an amazing achievement and its distribution went better than anyone expected. So there was a little hope by the time I finished and I wrote myself into a a state of mind that was a bit hopeful by looking back at American history at times when we faced crises at least as serious as the one we've been through and somehow came out better. Yeah, I mean, you're you're saying that the divisions that we face right now, which many people think are unique and new, are in fact things that America has seen for decades, hundreds of years, really. I think we're all familiar with the red and blue divide uh, in this country. That's the obvious one. It shows up at every election. It's real and it keeps getting bigger. But in my view, each side of that divide is in turn fractured in ways that I don't know if they'll be familiar to to British viewers, but perhaps you have something like this going on. We have a division on the right between what I call free America, which is libertarian, Republican orthodoxy, Ronald Reagan's America, and real America, which is the populist Trump America that said the real Americans have been left behind and pushed out of the way. and, And they are who basically the white Christian hardworking folk of the heartland. On the left, there's also a fracture. It's a generational split between the meritocrats, who I call smart America, those who believe that if you go to to the right schools and get a good education, you can move up and the, the country is on a path of progress. Their children, which I call just America, reject that and say, no, this country has always been based on oppression. It's a caste system and things don't really get better. In fact, progress is an illusion. We're not that different from the country that had slavery and segregation. Those two generations are now in a kind of a conflict over whose narrative is going to prevail. And so the fractures are deep and there are more of them than we generally talk about. And and so where, where do you come from? I mean, do you, do you come from smart America? I mean, you sound like you do. Yeah, yeah. I grew up on a college campus. My parents were professors. It was the 1960s. So I actually saw a generational conflict when I was a kid, the conflict between the World War II generation and the 60s generation, which in many ways resembles what we're going through today. I went to an Ivy League university. I entered the Peace Corps after college and worked in Togo in West Africa as an English teacher. And that was a, a bit of a step away from smart America into the world. And it was really a kind of shattering experience to find out that I didn't have the resources that I thought I did. I didn't have the ability to waltz through any challenge that I had been raised to think I had. And it was a good thing for me. I began to write at that point. I wrote out of that 
feeling of having been kind of wounded in some way. And my first book was about those Peace Corps years. It's called The Village of Waiting, about the village in Togo where I was a teacher. And that set me off on the course of, of being a writer. And something really important happened to me on my way home from Africa. I stopped in Barcelona feeling about as bad as I'd ever felt in my life. And I found a copy of Homage to Catalonia by George Orwell in an English bookshop and read it on the plane home. And something about the sentences in that book showed me a way I could live and write that would face hard truths and not run away from them and turn those hard truths into writing, in, into books. And that, I hope, has been the path I've been on ever ever since my early 20s. So, so let's just explore this division between smart America and just America a little bit more then. I mean, do you, or how much of, just, of smart America finds just America irritating, you know, uh, counterproductive? It, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's in universities. It's in magazines and newspapers. There are examples all over the place. One example from last summer, the New York Times, you know, the leading newspaper probably in the world still, published an opinion piece by a U.S. senator calling for the use of the U.S. military to put down rioting, looting, and burning that accompanied, in some cases, the massive social justice protests after the murder of George Floyd. This opinion piece stirred up so much opposition within the paper that younger, mostly younger reporters and staffers were essentially calling for the editor of that section to go, that this was a, a firing offense. The senior editors and the publisher were under all this pressure and they had to figure out what are we going to do? At first, they tried to talk what I think of as the talk of smart America. They said, well, we, we have to be open to lots of different points of view. The process broke down. It was not edited and fact checked correctly. We're going to improve our process. That did not satisfy the younger reporters and staffers of Just America. And in the end, the publisher fired this senior editor who may well have been in line to be the next executive editor of the paper. This was, for me, a kind of watershed where I f took the message that in journalism, the rules are now going to be different. What I thought of as the rules have been changed and the rules are now, there's a narrower set of parameters for what is acceptable opinion, what is publishable opinion. The crowd on Twitter is going to have a big say in how papers are edited and the loudest voices are probably going to prevail. And the claim of justice can be not just a claim of justice, but a form of power. And it can be abused as a form of power. So all of this for me was like, you asked how, how irritating it is. It's, I, I would say fear is the stronger emotion in smart America. People of my generation are afraid of younger people, whether in journalism, in academia, in the arts, in the professions generally. They're afraid of the moral wrath and in some ways of the, the truth behind the moral wrath that's coming from younger people. I mean, th this is strange though, isn't it? Because the values of just America are probably pretty close to you. You know, in terms of, you know, their aims, the things they believe in, the equalities they believe in, I mean, you know, um, Smart America shares most of that. And we're seeing the same thing in this Britain. You know, it's just called the war on woke here. Yet, you know, the, the, sort of the smart liberal left, if you like, suddenly finds itself allied with those on the right, with, with what you call free America, against this sort of hard line, you know, in Britain, what we call wokery, or, you know, what not we, but is called wokery, sort of um, disparagingly. And in America, you characterize as just. Well, I, the word woke is a very common word here too. I don't use it in my book because I think it's become too pejorative to, to be useful and to be fair. So I call it just America in keeping with the other Americas, free, smart, and real. I'm using the values they themselves think they have as the name to give to their narrative. But yeah, people like me, for example, my book has been better received by what we call never Trumpers who are like center right 
Republicans and former Republicans who are homeless now. They're politically homeless because Trump has taken the Republican Party in this disastrous direction. In some ways, I feel closer to them because I feel a bit politically homeless, too. Even though you're absolutely right, my political values are very close to the ideas of just America, whether it's racial equality, economic equality, reforming the criminal justice system, all of those I share most, if not all of what they want. It's what I don't like is the illiberalism that characterizes how they pursue it. And by that, I mean an intolerance, a kind of dogmatism that won't allow for other views to even be aired. You air them at your own risk. A sense of human beings as members above all of identity groups, which define us and which are inescapable. So that race, which should be considered a a lie, a fiction, a social construct, has become an essence in just America. It's the thing that defines you. These are illiberal ideas, and I think they're driving the social justice movement in the wrong direction, and they're alienating people. So it's going to be harder for them to achieve their goals. Well, well how, how is Joe Biden managing to straddle all of this then? Because he, he steps outside these sort of easy definitions, even though really he's from smart America. Yeah, I, it's a great question. And I've had to think about it since the book came out. And what I've concluded is Biden doesn't belong to any of these four Americas. He precedes them. He is a throwback to something more like the Roosevelt Truman America, the New Deal, World War II, Fair Deal America, which was a, in a way a simpler narrative. It, it was essentially that the working class, working people deserve a fair shake and government needs to be on their side in order to give them that fair shake. What does that mean? It means a decent life. It means labor rights and power. It means equal opportunity. It means the chance to have an education to raise your kids to be better off than you. These are really old fashioned ideas. I think this is Joe Biden's worldview and because he isn't part of these four narratives and he's not on social media and isn't involved in some of the fights that are currently ripping apart our fabric. He has articulated or at least embodied another narrative. I call it equal America, which is a narrative that essentially says equality is the fundamental value in American life. And we we have to get back to it or create it for the first time for some. I mean, you, you say he's not on social media. I mean, but he, I mean, I was looking the other day, he tweeted, we're building a workers economy. Which is an astonishing thing for, you know, an American mainstream president to tweet. You know, he is doing big things and big radical things. And he's doing, he's proposing things that are, you know, to the left of the British Labour Party in many ways. You know, he's spending huge amounts of money. You're right. But he's doing it in a way that doesn't fall into the trap that the British Labour Party has fallen into and that some of the American left has fallen into by lighting culture war fires everywhere he goes. He's not doing that. He doesn't talk about that. When he talks about it, it seems like a foreign language he's trying to use. For example, in speeches, he might use the word equality and then correct himself and say equity, because equity is the just America term for what used to be equality. But he has to force himself to do it. It's not natural. And I think that for that reason, Biden is the right man at the moment because he has lowered the temperature of the culture wars while pushing very hard, you're right, radically for an economy that is more equal and more fair. I think that's exactly what we need. It's the right politics. Is he, is he getting away with it bluntly because he's so old? Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, Obama was in many ways better at this stuff and better arti- at articulating it. But Biden seems to be more, as you say, you know, the man for this moment. I think... Old is perhaps helping him. People don't imagine that he's going to have, you know, he's going to dominate politics for a long time. I think Trump has helped him. Obama preceded Trump. Biden follows Trump. Following Trump is a great thing for any president, especially a president like Biden, who just embodies decency, 
and a kind of ordinariness that people were desperate for. We did not want to have to stare riveted to the horror of our president day in and day out. We wanted to be able to live our lives knowing the president cared about us, but wasn't going to be the, the center act every day. And that's Biden. So in a way, he benefits from having followed Trump. Of course, half the country doesn't support him. Uh, half the country would vote against him in a heartbeat, but they don't seem to hate him. Now, is that because Obama was black and therefore some people on the right or maybe in real America were a little quicker to, to hate him? Trump sort of stoked that with the birth certificate lie. Is it because Biden's just too familiar? He's like your grandfather. It's hard to hate your grandfather. It's easier to hate your father. I don't know, but he he, he has a small margin and there's a lot he's not going to get done because of our system being such a difficult one for any majority to work with. And he has a tiny majority, but right now he's making the most of it. And he's pointing us in the right direction. I mean, you, you do raise this question, don't you, of, of how, well, of how, how racist America is when it comes to, you know, the question of Obama and, and America's reaction to, to him. If all of these forces are still there, somebody like Joe Biden may put a smooth veneer over the divisions in America, but he's certainly, he's not removing them yet. And maybe he just doesn't have time to remove them, to be honest. Racism is not a fixed quality. It isn't something that you either have or don't have. There are some Americans, as there are people all over the world, who are just inherently hateful towards certain other groups. And there is really nothing to be done about them except to try to isolate them and to, to let the rest of the country know that it's unacceptable. I think there's other people for whom racial animosity waxes and wanes, depending on what's going on in the country and in their own life. Why is it that Trump's white support was concentrated in, in those without a college education. He did not have majority support of white people with a college education. So there are other factors that are going to shape the anxieties, the resentments, and even the hatreds. I think what Biden can do, he's not going to take a racist and turn him into a, a tolerant, peace-loving soul. But what he can do is lower the temperature by showing all Americans, especially workers, as he has been saying, that government can actually improve their lives. They may not like each other. They may not want to live next door to each other, but government can improve their lives. And therefore, there's some sense in which we're all in this together, which we haven't felt. What about your own understanding of that part of America? I mean, you were born in California. Your parents taught in Stanford. Is that right? Yep. How much do you, do you understand the other half of America? I mean, in one way, it's, it's a foreign country. Um, I wrote a book called The Unwinding about eight years ago that is basically immersive reporting in parts of the country that are generally ignored. Western North Carolina, the area around Youngstown, Ohio, the exurbs of Tampa Bay. And your own sort of road to Wigan Pier. It was it was a deep uh, I didn't go down any coal mines, um, but I did spent a ton of time in those places and even lived in, in one place uh, with someone who was from there. So what did I learn? I mean, first of all, the most basic thing, they're human beings. They're not ogres, they're not cartoon figures. We turn each other into cartoon figures on Twitter. We turn ourselves into cartoons on Twitter. But when you have to actually sit across a table from someone, there's gonna be something that seems not necessarily to justify their views, but to explain their views. So I'm not saying let's all go soft on each other if we deeply disagree, but I am saying if you spend enough time with people who are not like you, as I did in the years I was working on The Unwinding, you will, you will inevitably become a bit humble about your own fixed views and a bit more, if not tolerant, at least more open-minded about the views of others. And you'll actually begin to see there are things we have in common. There's a whole part of Last Best Hope where I talk about the things that Americans share that we don't see, but foreigners immediately pick up on. They know who's an American, regardless of which America 
the person comes from because we have a national identity just as people in other countries do. It's been buried now under all these divisions and inequalities, but we still have it. And I think it comes back to the desire to be equal, to be as good as anyone else. I think that's the fundamental national trait, and I'd like us to get back to it. Do, do, you, do you think that, re- that it is a, a desire to be equal, though, or a sort of a myth of equal opportunity? Well, this is, goes back to Alexis de Tocqueville and his really permanently great book, Democracy in America. His main insight into Americans was what he called the passion for equality, not the ideal of equality or not the belief that everyone should be equal, because obviously throughout our history, lots of Americans have not thought that other Americans should be their equal. But the individual desire to be as good as everyone else, to have no opportunity closed off because of who you are or where you come from, to have all the rights and the status. It's almost like a spiritual desire that Tocqueville said makes Americans distinct. And I think it still exists. And it explains a lot of social conflict because when it is stifled, we fight. We don't accept a a second class status, no matter what group is going to be conflict and even violence. So there is no real equal opportunity, but if there's a deep desire to have equal opportunity, that's a lot in itself and something that a a shrewd politician like Joe Biden should see and tap into. Do do you think that is still, though, a clear American value, a shared value, given, I mean, what it seemed like, you know, was that you know, quite a lot of Trump supporters didn't want that. Not not that they didn't want it for themselves, but that they didn't want it for other people. You know, it's not. It's, it's that sort of, you know, it's not enough for me to succeed. Somebody else must fail. I think you're right there. That's why I said it isn't necessarily an ideal for everyone, but it's a, it's a desire for oneself. And I, I think I want to start with that because what you desire for yourself is sort of the irreducible thing. That's not going to go away. Your ideals may change. They may come and go. But what you want to be uh, in relation to your country is is going to stay. I think Trump supporters felt that they had been in some ways left behind or pushed out of the way or other people had cut in line ahead of them. They resented it. They resented people like me, the, the liberal elites in the cities who they thought despise them for not having an education, for not having gone to college, for their retrograde views, et cetera. And they, that Trump played on that resentment. He understood it deeply. He resented people like me. He knew, he knew how they felt. And so he manipulated it. And in a sense, he said, I will make you equal. In fact, I will raise you above them. You are the real Americans. When when I say make America great again, I mean you. They will be sunk down. But what you will have to do is give me your freedom. Give me your ability to say this is true and this is not. Give it all to me and I'll make you equal or better than equal. And that was a deal his followers were ready to take, which proves Tocqueville's point that Americans value equality more than they value their own freedom, which sounds perverse since we're supposed to be a freedom loving people, but actually Americans are quite willing to give their freedom to a demagogue as long as he offers them this thing in in return. And so how do you bring these four Americas together? I mean, do you think they can be? No, I think it's really difficult. And it won't happen. It, they can't be brought together ever in any encompassing way because there are these incredible divisions that are real. Because you might have thought coronavirus might have brought the country together in a way, but it clearly hasn't, has it? Yeah. I mean, if anything was a universal problem, threat, condition, it was a virus that attacked you because you're human. So it should have made us think about our common humanity. Plagues rarely do that. They usually make people afraid of each other, fear fear and hate each other, want to stay away from each other. In our case, I think more than most countries, the plague became a political division. Trump used it to divide, to say, you know, masks are 
or an infringement. The lockdown is taking away your rights. So he didn't make any effort to bring us together. And sure enough, we were divided. What could bring us together? I mean, first of all, what I'm calling equal America, which is, I think, Biden's essential view, a program that treats people, especially people at the lower end of the economic ladder, as deserving the same opportunities as others and giving it to them through government interventions, through really big government programs of the kind that Roosevelt brought in the New Deal. And second, and this is a little harder to do, but Americans just need to come together in ways that are we don't even think about, whether it's through a national service program where every young person has to spend a year doing projects with other young people from totally different backgrounds, or through education about our democracy that teaches us how to listen and debate and argue and persuade rather than simply dividing schools into left and right, which is happening today. They seem inadequate, I know, because the divides are so big, but we have to start somewhere. And I think the first place is to to be face to face. Do you think national service is actually a a possibility? I think... It's probably more popular among older people than younger people, uh, which is a sign that it may have a little bit of hypocrisy involved. I think if Biden made it his Peace Corps, John F. Kennedy appealed to American idealism with the Peace Corps. If Biden spoke to all young Americans as having both something to gain and something to give, I think there's a longing if Biden you, he's not eloquent. He doesn't give a good speech, but he speaks in a kind of plain, ordinary way that reminds me a bit of Harry Truman. If he used that and made this one of his major efforts, I think Republicans would be a bit hard pressed to be absolutely opposed to it because it sounds patriotic. It sounds like something Americans should should want to do. Pa- patriotism is, is, is something as well that's is a tricky one in, 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 in British politics as well, in that the left has always struggled slightly with the language of patriotism. Not, not with the reality of patriotism, I think, but certainly with the language of it and, and attacking nationalism of the right while also trying to appear patriotic. I mean, how, how do you think it's... How is that achieved in America more successfully? You know, until the 60s, the left had no trouble speaking the language of patriotism. Franklin Roosevelt turned the New Deal into the most powerful patriotic narrative maybe since Lincoln. But the 60s divided the country generationally and the left, because of the Vietnam War and because of the way Nixon and the right used the flag, the left felt uncomfortable. Like patriotism made them just sort of uneasy, like as if you're smoking in a restaurant or something, it's not done. And if you drive around a rural road and see an American flag, you're immediately going to assume that that's a Trump supporter, even if it's not. So it's not going to it's not a matter of the left waving flags. It's a matter of understanding that if you truly want to change the country in big ways, whether it's reversing inequality or slowing down climate change or ending racism, or saving our democracy. You cannot do it without a sense of an attachment to the country. You need something on that scale to be involved. You need a sense of national solidarity or else you're gonna lose because we'll we'll remain too divided and you won't attract people. World citizenship is too abstract an identity for most people, but national identity still appeals. It's the largest identity people have, I think. And if the left can find a way to appeal to it without using false language, their their cause will be strengthened. Do you think anything's changed in American media since the since the demise of Trump? You know, is it less polarized? No, no, it's the same. What's changed is it's lost its audience. Every cable news program, newspaper, magazine has lost audience since Trump. He was very good for the media. He kept everything at a boil. And the media, I think, in some ways played along 
by looking for conflict and for division, as we do, sometimes where it didn't exist or exaggerating it where it did exist. And I think the media has not learned very much and really needs to go back to what any democracy really needs from its journalists, which is reporting, which is stories and, and facts that can become commonly accepted instead of each side having its own set of facts. It's hard to do, but one way to do it is to cut down on opinion journalism, to cut down on journalists building up their brand by getting on a platform and instead to reward journalists who are actually doing the hard reporting that we need. We've lost all of our local newspapers. So small cities around the country no longer have their own news. They don't know what's going on. So you can imagine corruption is easier and scandal. We need to find incentives to go back to a journalism that actually gives people news about where they live. And that can also be a, a more unifying kind of journalism. Do you, do you think people want that? I mean, you know, did, did we get what, what, what people actually wanted? We, we want conflict. We, you know, Twitter and Facebook have perfected the addictive algorithms. But people want to smoke, but the tobacco companies made it impossible not to smoke. So it's, it's sort of a vicious circle. People want the quick hit of Twitter, but Twitter makes it impossible not to stick around for more quick hits. So I think there, there's blame in, in, in all of us, but there's also structures that are making it impossible to get out of this. And I think we have to find ways to change those structures. I mean, you, you sort of, you end um, the book much as you, you start it in terms of your appeal to America. You know, that you must do this because you're Americans. Are you, are you hopeful? Well, I think we have no choice. We have only been a self-governing democracy. We're now in danger of losing that. And for the first time really since the Civil War, I'd say, or maybe the 30s, really in danger of seeing our democracy slip away. It could. We're, there's nothing written that we will always be a country with majority rule and minority rights written into our constitution. So to me, that's the peril. And it requires a really difficult balancing act to, to save this democracy. On the one hand, to absolutely fight any attempt to shred democracy, to lie about democracy, to overthrow elections, to create laws that favor certain Americans and, and, and their votes and disfavor others. We have to fight that every step of the way and yet retain in our minds a certain openness to a connection to each other so that we don't miss every chance because there are chances to find ways to remain one country or to be a country again. It's a very hard thing to do both of those that's what I'm trying to do in Last Best Hope is to, to find a way to think about democracy as both a partisan, which I am, and a citizen, and not lose that. I mean, if we carry on as we have been, or if you carry on as you have been, is there an, an inevitability towards losing the democracy you talk about? Or could you just carry on? You know, could everything just carry on being a bit rubbish? Yeah, we're, we're pretty capable of that. Uh, I have this image of, of we're, we're a giant freighter with, with mass and, and speed that keeps on going, even after the engine has cut out. Like we, our engine is cutting out, the engine being democracy. And yet we keep moving forward in the same direction just because we're so big, we're so rich, uh, we're so distracted by our lives, by the next thing, by novelties. But I think Trump was a warning it doesn't mean it's always going to be this way. And another term of Trump would have meant, I think, the end of something fundamental about our democracy. And we still have millions of Americans who believe his lies and who think the election was stolen and who think the next election is going to be stolen unless they steal it first, <laughs> which is kind of where we're moving. So that's that's a perilous direction to go in, even if it seems like basically life is the same as it's always been. You might suddenly wake up and find, ah, uh, an election no longer matters. What do we do now? Well, we probably are going to fight each other if we get to that point. 
I mean, it is, is one of the big problems. I mean, it comes back to sort of what you're saying about understanding each other. The, the two sides still want to destroy the other. You know, that there is no real sense of value in opposition. You know, that the, the, the aim of, 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 a, of a political movement is still to make sure that the other one can't rise back up. Well, that's probably a good description of politics. And it depends on how they make sure. If they do it by winning elections... And even by propaganda and a certain amount of grandstanding, that's always true. We're always going to be that way. If they do it by lying and by using lies to warp the thinking of their entire side and then changing the rules in a way that guarantees that they will win the next time out and then lying about that. Well, then we're getting into a kind of disinformation atmosphere that's closer to an authoritarian country than we want to be or should be. That's where we're moving now. And it's really only one side that's pushing us hard. The other side is reacting and in some ways picking up on some of the same qualities in reaction. But the main driver of this is Trump's people. We have to be honest about that. There's no balance here. And that's where I, my only hope is that if they see their lives improving under Joe Biden directly because of his policies and realize that Republican policies don't help them or even don't exist, maybe it'll take a generation, but the the Trump fever will break and it will go back to ordinary, nasty, hardball politics. And if you could change the world in any way, what would you do? I would get us all to spend less time strutting and dunking and showing off and whipping up our tribe on social media and more time actually having the uncomfortable experience of sitting down with someone you deeply disagree with and even may dislike and having a conversation. Pretty simple, might not have immediate effects, but I think it would be a good a step in the right direction. Just do social, but not social media. Yeah, we're human. Remember that that's a human being. People on Twitter write as if the person they're writing about is not human. And then you meet them, as I've had the experience of doing, and they're actually a rather decent person. And I think, why is that decency not reflected in your Twitter persona? Why do you have to be such a blowhard or so dishonest or so mean on Twitter. Well, it's because Twitter wants you to be. Twitter rewards you for being that way. So tell Twitter, go to hell. I'm not going to be that person, at least today. I'm going to go out and actually sit down and talk to one of those people who I was trying to destroy on social media yesterday. George Packer, thank you very much indeed. Thanks for talking about your ways to change the world. I hope you enjoyed listening to that. If you did, then please do give us a rating or a review so other people can find the podcast. You can watch all of these interviews as well on the Channel 4 News YouTube channel. Our producer is Rachel Evans. Until next time, bye-bye.